Fathers love everyone and welcome. This week we're going to hear part one of a two-part message by Leonard Ravenhill entitled The Real Cost of Discipleship. So as always, kick back, relax, and let's see what the Holy Spirit has to teach us this week. Let's read some verses from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 3 and reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. And I, brethren, <clears throat> could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? <clears throat> who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. One of the most forgotten men in the church, at least amongst the so-called great men, <clears throat> was a man by the name of Henry Varley. He was a great preacher, and on one occasion he shot out a statement which has come a kind of become a kind of classic in the vocabulary of preachers. He said, the world is yet to see what God can do through one man who is totally committed to Jesus Christ. Well, it was a kind of an arrow shot at a venture. <clears throat> but in the audience, there was a young man. He, he wasn't very learned. His education was almost zero. But he kind of caught that thought as it went past. No, no man, the world has not yet seen a man who is 100% committed to Jesus Christ. And so he said under his breath, well, by the grace of God, I'll be that man. All he did was sell shoes in a store there in Chicago. And some of you know him, I'm sure. His name was D.L. Moody. You know, when I think of that, I always take issue with it because I'm quite sure that that was not a true statement. The world is yet to see. Are you suggesting God had had to wait 2,000 years, that Jesus had to find a man that he could totally inhabit because all self and sin had been purged out of him and his will had been surrendered and his personality, uh, he was a love slave to God? Why, right at the beginning of history, Christian history, there was a man who was so totally sold out to God that we, I don't think I've ever seen his like since. You remember his story begins, as far as we're concerned, going down the Damascus Road. And in the 26th of Acts, where he gives his testimony before Agrippa, <coughs> he, he, he doesn't cover the blemishes. He, he doesn't try to minimize the, the wicked zeal that he has. He, he doesn't say, I'm sorry and trembling and blushing, that I, I, I have to admit that I was a murderer. He, he says, I went down that, uh, that road and I was going to exterminate the whole church of Jesus Christ. Being exceedingly mad, he says. Not just mad, he was blazing with anger. To think that some people were following a man who died on a cross. To think they wouldn't go to the temple and offer sacrifices and regard the high priest and, and go through all the different and uh, very wonderful things on the calendar of the church or their church. But going down that Damascus road, <coughs> God got hold of that murderer and made him a messenger. He got hold of the persecutor and made him the greatest preacher ever. He got hold of the executor and made him the greatest expounder of the gospel that the world has ever seen. 
He says, giving his own testimony, that when he went down that Damascus road, that the, the Lord appeared unto me. He revealed himself to me. That later he says, he revealed himself in me. He daringly says over and over, you remember Galatians 2.20 quoted so often, uh, that, that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. I believe that's the most awesome thing any man can say this side of eternity. Not that he walked on the moon. Not that he's in the who's who. The only who's who I'm interested in, God's who's who. <laughs> when we get up there, there'll be some shocks, I think. The greatest thing that could ever cross your lips is to stand and say to the world, the flesh, the devil, the in-laws and outlaws, Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, not when I shuffle off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare says, but the life I now live in the flesh, surrounded with all the adversities and temptations and trials, and all the things that can come, and yet Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, <clears throat> I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul has an amazing pedigree. He forgets it all. <coughs> As he ends his letter to the Galatians, he says in the 14th verse of chapter 6, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified to me, and I am crucified to the world. Now there's a thing you and I have never seen. We have never seen the agonizing death of the man on a cross. Oh, well, of course, in the days of the Romans, it was a sport. Immediately a man was nailed to the cross. He lost all his rights. And if you ever get nailed to the cross, you'll lose all yours too. Immediately he was nailed on the cross and he was exalted. The people could do as they like. They could throw a bucket of filth on him. They could throw their rotten eggs. They could stone him. He had no rights. And before he died, his eyes would be gouged out, his ribs would be broken, blood would be dripping from him. And everybody got excited, particularly if it was a kind of a Barabbas who was there. He deserves all he gets. He, he's destroyed other people's lives. He's raped people. He, he, he's broken people's minds. And, and so they go on with a list of things that he'd done. And he should die a thousand deaths. But as soon as the bell tolled in the city, they didn't stay there. They went back into the city. At six o'clock, they could see that bleeding victim. There was nobody there at six o'clock in the morning. On the arms of the cross were the vultures. They'd pick out the eyes. They'd tear the body. The blood would run out. Then the dogs came out of Jerusalem and, and, and licked up the, the, the blood as they did the blood of Jezebel. Nobody wanted to photograph it. They didn't have photography, but nobody wanted to see it. A bloody spectacle. A man whose innards were hanging out. A man whose body is so distorted you could hardly tell it was a human frame. It had been lashed with rocks. It was covered with filth. It had only excrement and every other offensive thing. And Paul says, when I said goodbye to the world, I said goodbye to a filthy thing. The world is crucified to me. It's a filthy world. It's a corrupt world. But not only that, he says, I'm crucified to the world. People would say of the Apostle Paul, here's a man, he's got acres of culture. He's got a colossal intellect. He'll be a greater high priest than Hillel or any other high priest you ever had in history. And the fool of a man, he's been so charmed with this Christianity that he's resigned all that he could have in the world. Yeah, it's easy for you and I to sing with eyes of quartz, we're the whole realm of nature mine. <laughs> I'm afraid we don't do it. Love's so amazing, so divine. This man had a revelation of God that I don't think anybody's had before or since. I'm quite sure he quoted with fervency, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He sees the great expanse of the world. Why, look at this man's staggering life. 
He began his life in the historic capital of the world, Tarsus. He ended his life in the military uh, capital of the world, Rome. He went to the intellectual capital of the world in the 17th of Acts there, and, 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 and they discovered this little undersized man. When they saw him, they said his bodily presence is weak, and they discovered he had a staggering, scintillating intellect. They quoted poetry, answered with poetry. They quoted philosophy, answered with philosophy. They quoted their history, he answered with their history. This man is all round, he's fully developed man. And they're staggered by this amazing man. And then he came to a situation that the great Scottish preacher called some years ago. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of his name, it was James something. But anyhow, years ago he said, <coughs> they listened intently to Paul. They, they were staggered that this little Jew should know much, so much about Greek history, Greek philosophy. I'm sure he'd read Plato, all the other stuff. But then, as a great preacher says, he took the trumpet of the resurrection. He went down the street, and when he saw the street, it was lined with churches, as we would say. It was lined with places of worship. Oh, this, 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 this doesn't stagger too many of us, does it? We, we just go down the street and say, there's a Roman Catholic church, that's Jehovah's Witnesses, that's the Mormons, where the Herr Krishna meet there, and the Muniites meet there, and so on. Does it stir you that those people have been treating, tre teaching false gods and they rape people's minds just as a man might rape a girl's body? It says in the sleepy Elizabethan English that when he saw all these people, colossal intellects, many of them, and yet they were tricked and duped by false religion, and it says in the sleepy Elizabethan English that his spirit was stirred within him. I'm not very fond of the Amplified, except where it agrees with me. <clears throat> but uh, the Amplified doesn't say his spirit was stirred within him. He says that when he saw all these people tricked, seduced by, by, by deceiving spirits, he was angry about it. Do, do, do you ever feel a holy anger? We're, we're dealing with 1 Corinthians chapter 3 <coughs> and talking about, at the moment, we're talking about the 14th verse of, of the uh, epistle to the Galatians where Paul says, God forbid that I should glory. No man ever had a pedigree greater than the apostle Paul. Of the tribe of Benjamin, of the seed of Abraham, he has everything going for him. Again, I say, I believe he had a colossal intellect. I think he had a very brilliant mind. Uh, he, he met the philosophers. I said he began his life in the ancient capital of the world, Tarsus. He went to the intellectual capital of the world, which was Athens, and he reasoned with them there. Uh, and yet, there is no epistle of Paul to the Athenians. Why? Well, I'm not going to criticize Paul. I'm just going to say this. He didn't talk about redemption. What he did say... And they couldn't believe it. He took the gospel trumpet to his lips. And he sounded the resurrection. You see, they did have an altar to an unknown God. And he said, that's the unknown God I declare to you. He made the heavens and the earth. His son died and rose again. And, and he was resurrected. And they showed him the gate. No, we can't listen to that kind of stuff. From there, he went from the intellectual capital of the world, and he'd been also, later he'll go to the religious capital of the world, Jerusalem, but he steps down from the place where they worship the brain to the place where they worship the body, Corinth. In the days of the apostle, you didn't have to string a hundred adjectives together about a man's corruption and his licentiousness and everything else. You just tagged him with one word, he's a Corinthian, and immediately you knew he was the vilest of the vile. And the old German commentator, Meyer, not F.B. Meyer, he was English, but F, the other Meyer, a German commentator, says this, Blessed and sublime miracle of God that a church of Jesus Christ could be established in Corinth. It's 
Shakespeare said you can't make a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. God can do better than that. He can take the most depraved, despised, and rejected men and make them saints to God. It says in the first of Samuel that he lifts the beggar from the dunghill and makes them princes unto God. I remember about 15 or 16 years ago when we were working with Dave Wilkerson in those days when David was hardly known, and yet we had a full house. This side of the prayer chapel was filled with girls, this with men, and a little fellow stood up and he said, Brother Raven, let's come to preach for us. The little Puerto Rican fellow, his face was radiant, and he said, before he sing, we stand up and sing. Sing the national anthem. Oh, I thought, baloney, sing the national anthem right before I preach. <laughs> I didn't get what he said. He didn't say sing the national anthem. He sing our national anthem. He said, we sing our national anthem. So I thought the Puerto Ricans must have one. And he stood up there and did not he started to sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. It was grace that taught my, it was grace. And you know, before we got to the end, when we'd been there 10,000 years, he changed it to 10 million. Well, it wasn't bad, 10 trillion would have been better, but <clears throat> he, 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 he got there, and you know, there wasn't a dry eye on those, those girls who had been prostitutes. Some of them had carried guns. Everyone had been pushed. The tears were flowing. They used to make other people weep. Now they're weeping. Why? Amazing grace. Sure, Paul loved the word. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And then afterwards he writes to Ephesians. He not only loved the, the world and gave his son, he says he loved me. But he says Christ gave himself for the church. But greater than loving the world and loving the church, he says, do you know what he did? He loved me. Do you ever fall at his feet and say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, not our souls? Thank you for blotting out the horrible record of my sin. Some of you didn't have much. And it's true that those who have been saved from much love much. You remember that brilliant king? He was mentioned this morning in Psalm 51. And in another psalm he says what? He lifted me up out of a horrible pit. This hand was running with crime and, and this with adultery. And my history was rotten. And he's not asking God, uh, just, just uh, kindly forgive my sins and uh, I'll go about my business. He's not asking for some superficial knowledge that somehow the relationship is kind of restored and all is well. He goes further than that. He says, search me in a Psalm 139 and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. He says in that 51st Psalm, I want truth in the inward parts. Oh, that's cutting close, isn't it? Not just out of my mind and my conscience, but in the inward part, the, the central register of my being, that truth may be there. Paul finishes his letter to the Galatians. Oh, it, it's so beautiful. He doesn't have his tongue in his cheek and say, you know, I wonder if I've done the right thing. I could have had a good influence for, for God if I'd stayed in the old place and uh, I'd uh, had a worldwide reputation and... Uh, th no, 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 no. I like what he says at the end of the chapter there. <coughs> I'm reading from the Living Bible, King James. Uh, <coughs> and... <coughs> The 17th verse of the last chapter says this. I like it. Listen to his defiance. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I think Moffat translates that. Henceforth, let no man trouble me. I bear in my body the brands of Jesus Christ. Oh, they knew what he meant in the temple of Heracles. In the days of slavery... A man would run away from his taskmaster, brutal taskmaster. And he would rush to the temple. They had priests there. They were, they were on guard day and night, often asleep. But anyhow, that's what preachers are. 
And you might have to wake the uh, preacher up, and, and you say, I, 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 oh, he says, have you escaped? Yes, I've escaped. Uh, uh, brand me, brand me. Well, choose the weapons, what, what, you know, like we brand cattle here. Uh, which God do you want to be branded with? He chooses this stigmata. He, he chooses the, the, the mark, the brand of a certain God, and he's branded on his hands. Can you imagine him putting his hand out, clenching his teeth, uh, and that flesh sizzles when that hot iron goes on it? He slips down his toga if he was wearing one, and he's branded on the back of his neck. He lifts up his foot, and he's branded on his instep. Paul says, don't trouble me. I'm branded. I bear the marks of a slave. I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I've no will of my own. I've no rights of my own. There's an old hymn established on that very theme. Let my hands perform his bidding. Let my feet run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise. All for Jesus. All my beings ransom powers. All my thoughts and words and doings. All my days and all my hours. This man is no professional preacher. Preaching is not a profession. It's a passion. If man can't preach with passion. He shouldn't preach at all. Not a profession. A passion. There's no breath of professionalism anywhere in the ministry of Paul, and thank God there's no breath of commercialism either. Peter said in his day that some will make merchandise of you. That couldn't be more true than the day in which we're living. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I bear here at the back of my neck a brand which tells you that this part of my being, my thinking, my philosophy is that of Jesus Christ, my teaching, my feet. Isn't it staggering how, how, how far this amazing man went? Look at his missionary journeys without airplanes, without trains. God put something in him. The stupid world tried to get it out of him. But God put something, something in him. And, and they lashed him 195 times. And they couldn't whip it out of him. And he hung on a piece of wood in the Mediterranean for 36 hours. And they couldn't wash it out of him. And they tried to threaten it out of him. But almighty God put something in there, you see. They were not trying to kill the apostle Paul, the idiots. They were trying to kill Jesus Christ. Because Christ lived in him. And he says, I don't know whether to desire and depart or be here because it's not much better off up there in one sense. I still got Christ inside. <coughs> he says his life is hid with Christ in God. <coughs> so you see this man moving, establishing churches. One amazing thing, and I, I, I often say this to young preachers who ask me about preaching, and I don't know much about it. I've been trying to do it for about 60, or just over 60 years now. It's still a mystery, I think, as dear pastor said this morning. You see, some people have got everything out in one, two, three, four. If they have, I throw the book away. The older I get, the more I realize great is the mystery of godliness. Why isn't God brooding over our stained glass windows in America this morning? Why isn't he brooding on our super multi-million dollar TV and radio programs with all the flash and show they have? The greatest areas where God is breathing this morning is amongst people that are in poverty and in need. The Africa in the, pardon me, the, the revival in Nagaland, which is north, northeast India. I read a report a brother sent recently. He went expecting a finite like, like revival. We think we're going to make a carbon copy and say, Lord, double it that way. Now, now, you know, don't rock the boat. In the 11th of July, in the Wall Street Journal, which I'm sure many of you take because of your interest <coughs> investments, <coughs> but uh, in the Wall Street Journal for the 11th of July, it says, I was going to bring the document and I forgot it, but it says there, <coughs> an evangelical revival is moving over America just now, but it's having little effect. 
That's like saying there was an earthquake from California to New York last night, 8.6 on the Richter scale, but nobody felt it. You talk about the fullness of God. What, what Paul did, you know, right after he was born again, after that miracle happened on the Damascus Road. I'm glad one man stayed to listen what God had to say that morning. He didn't just pray. He listened and God said, Ananias, get up and go to the street, go straight, and that's the house. Isn't it great to know that God knows your name and address? Postman may forget it, but God knows it. And he goes down and says to him, Brother Saul, that must have startled him. I mean, he was going to kill that man. And he goes and says, Brother Saul, the Lord hath appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. And you know, only God can make you a minister. Nobody else can do that. They may teach you a few things in Bible school, but they never make you a preacher. The Lord hath appeared to thee. And then he disappears. <clears throat> he goes into the wilderness. God revealed himself in him. I hope you understand my language here. I believe in that period of three and a half years that Paul became spiritually pregnant. I believe the Spirit of God birthed all these epistles which afterwards he would give birth to. I believe he birthed all those churches because he writes afterwards, doesn't he, to the Galatians. And he says, little children, for whom I travel in birth. You talk about out of him shall flow living, rivers of living water. Fourteen epistles if you give him Hebrews. And I think he wrote Hebrews as well. Fourteen matchless epistles. I remind you again, Christianity was not served up to the world on a silver platter. Christianity was served up or it was born in a sophisticated totalitarian society. And yet Jesus never said anything about slavery. All these boys are rushing to Washington. They then put God's house right, but they want to put the White House right. The answer to our present moral and political and every other dilemma we have in the nation will not be solved in the upper room at the White uh, in, uh, pardon me, in the oval room at the White House. It will be solved if it's solved at all in the upper room in God's house. The way the preachers are rushing to Washington, you'd think that the politicians were the salt of the earth. They're not. They can't put their own house in order, never mind us. God strictly forbid that Israel should go down to Egypt for help and all these boys are rushing to the politicians. We want to get the Bible back in school. Well, I'm not too worried about that. I'd like to see the Bible back in every home. Then forget the school. Some of us want the school teacher to do what daddy and mummy should do. Do you wonder when he surveyed the wondrous cross? I think we slip over that way. You ever see a surveyor on the road? You know how meticulous he is? He gets that, well, there are many names for it. Let's call it a telescope. <clears throat> but <laughs> he gets it then, he looks and they wave to each other and he goes this way or that. Oh, a man's very, very careful when he does a surveying job. No man surveyed a cross, the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died like the Apostle Paul. My richest gain I count but lost. Yes, sir, he did it over and over and over again. After all, if you lay the cross on the ground, it points north, south, east, and west. It has a message for the whole world. If you stand it up, it points to a topless heaven and a bottomless hell. And the arms, as Charles Wesley said, the arms of love that compass me would all mankind embrace. Paul has no fear. Do you know what he did? I would to God some of you fellows would do it. Do you know what he once did? He said, I bow the knee to the Father. And because he bowed the knee to the Father, he never bowed the knee to anybody else. Neither demons or politicians or kings. He stood there, regal. Isn't it something that there's a, a man there, suave, and in his gorgeous robes and his uh, beautiful rings, and all society gasping when Felix walks in? And before he finished, Felix's knees were knocking together. It says Felix trembled. 
He goes to one of the most distinguished men of the day, and what does he say? You almost persuade me to be a Christian. I'm on the very verge of it. Paul says, I would to God that you are even as I am, except for these chains. <coughs> Isn't that lovely? He has his chains on. The difference between Paul and the man on the throne, the man on the throne had chains, but they were on the inside. Paul's chains were on the outside. He had none on the inside. He was free. Free from the fear of men. Free from the fear of consequences. Free from anything the devil might put on him or other people. From henceforth he says, let no man trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm afraid that Paul would look on with compassion and real pity on our feeble faith. I sometimes say this is a day of thin theology and fat preachers. And I'm sure it is. There's no sentimental Christianity with the Apostle Paul. There's no such thing as coming to the cross and just getting your sins forgiven. Oh, no, 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 no. The man who only wants his sins forgiven is trifling with Christianity. He needs more than his sins forgiven. He needs more than that, that horrid record. Maybe you sin enough to damn a thousand people. And God in his infinite mercy, when you confess and you plead and you're broken hearted and you're penitent and you repent, he takes that record and flings it into his eternal backyard is like, never to be remembered against us anymore forever. But man needs more than forgiveness. He needs cleansing. He needs more than cleansing. He needs indwelling. He needs to get to read to the bondage of sin. He becomes a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Now I said Paul came to the in the intellectual capital where they worship the brain and he came down to Corinth where they worship the body. The continual talk in Athens was wisdom. The continual talk in Corinth was wickedness. I, I don't read he sent out a letter asking for support to get there. I don't read he made reservations in the Holiday Inn or somewhere. This man is prepared to follow the step of Jesus every way as far as possible. Somebody said to a friend of mine recently who might be doing some building for God, he said, listen, let me give you a word of advice. Don't build anything that will embarrass you in a few years. That's a very good point. I see God's money going in stately buildings and swimming pools and tennis courts and I want to vomit. With the world starving, with the mission field needing money. Paul attacks Corinth. Well, uh, he, he doesn't go with his philosophical stuff. He, he doesn't dazzle them with his knowledge. He says, listen, he begins the epistle, doesn't he, by saying, uh, I, I'm not coming to you with enticing words of man's wisdom. Uh, almost saying, I just tried that out at the last place, and those, those philosophers and Stoics and Epicureans and others, they, uh, they marveled. They opened their eyes. They were, they were staggered by what I said, but I didn't get through to them. And so I'm going right back, back, back to the foundation. Some years ago, there was a professor in America. His book has recently been republished. <coughs> I think, I'm not sure if he was at Yale. No, Princeton. He was only in his 40s when he contracted a terrible disease. His body began to droop. He began to shuffle. He tried to get an answer to his problem and he couldn't and so one day somebody said to him, you need to go to Paris, there's a doctor there. Now this was when ships were slow, not even fast ships and certainly no planes. When he got to Paris, somebody said to him, no, 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 we don't have the answer. Uh, I, I think you'll find it in Geneva. And Geneva, they said, no, we, we don't have the answer here. The answer is in Austria. He got to Austria and somebody said, no, the answer is in France. He got to France, they said, it's across the channel in England. In England they said, no, 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 we don't have the answer. The, the, the physician who has the answer is there in Scotland. When he got there, the physician said, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have the answer to it. We've done some investigation, but we've got no answer. Like our day, we can diagnose cancer, we can't cure it. 
We're so busy putting billions into armaments, we let folk die on our doorstep. So we'll have enough stuff to destroy other countries. Isn't that wonderful? Don't have the answer. He came back. He was acting on the ship almost to throw himself overboard. One day he was going down the street not far from Princeton. The man said to him, excuse me, sir, aren't you Professor James? He said, yes. Well, you're very sick. Isn't it amazing people state the obvious? I was lying in plaster from my chin to my toes. I jumped out of a burning hotel in 1951. and brought my back in three places. My left leg was in three pieces. My feet were in both broken up. Hey, I'm lying in bed, you know, can't turn, can't do anything, can't shave, can't feed myself. My darling wife watched me day and night. And somebody walks in and says, hello, Brother Raven, are you sick? <laughs> no, I'm just getting ready to play tennis. Can't you see I've got my, my tennis things on? <clears throat> it's pouring rain and you're soaking. Someone says, oh, it's raining. Oh, thanks for the news. Shivering with cold. Saying, it's cold. Yeah, that's why I'm muffled up to my ears. It's cold. You're sick. You need to find a, a deliverer. Friend, there's no deliverance. I've been all over Europe. I've spent a fortune. Sir, he said, if you go down the street and knock on the door of so-and-so and tell him, John sent you. Why? Does he have the answer? Mm-hmm. The professor went and knocked at the door. Just a little laboring man came. His hands were not, you know, those smooth, gentle hands that could take a scalpel and do surgery. They, they were all knotted and gnarled, and, and the man obviously wasn't very well educated. <coughs> the professor said, <laughs> uh, as you see, I, I, I have a terrible disease, and it's, it's, it's galloping. It's, it's getting hold of me quickly, and I, I do want to get rid of it, and I understand you have a cure for it. The man said, well... <laughs> I can pray for you. The professor said, what? He, he said, I can pray for you. I, 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 can, uh, I can put some oil on your head. And uh... Professor James said, my psychology was saying, that won't work. And my pride was saying, you can't kneel in front of this ignoramus, you with a couple of PhDs and all. But you see, the PhDs didn't do anything for him. And all his philosophy didn't do anything for him. So he went in the house. And he said, sir, whatever you say, I'll do it. The man said, kneel down. He knelt down. The little fellow got some oil, put it on his hand. Papa would have enjoyed doing this. Put some oil on his head. I've done that thousands of times, I think. Brother Salerno too. Some of us, brother, here. Yeah. The professor's waiting. He thought some flash would come from heaven or something. The man put his trembling hands on the head of the, the great professor. And he said a few things, and then he said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be made whole. The professor jumped out. I felt as though 10,000 volts of electricity touched me. Oh, yeah, my legs are all right. Yeah, I'm great. I, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. The little man said, I don't either. <laughs> Except that God was faithful to answer prayer. The point is he went halfway around the world in order to answer, find an answer. And we're going all around the world. We're trying to find an answer through psychology and para this and para that and heaven knows what. And the answer is in the old rugged cross so despised by the world. It's got every answer to our human dilemma, even sickness and mental disorders. I don't care how you emphasize the tragedy that Adam brought into the world. Are you going to suggest to me that there is no way where the human heart can be cleansed? Did, did Satan pollute the very foundation of, of human society and, and God has no answer to th that pollution? I like that hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life. I like the phrase in it that says, That then shall all bondage cease, and all fetters fall. Paul had seen men and women redeemed from corruption. He'd seen them transformed, and now he's writing to them 18 months afterwards. 
And he says, you carnal. You carnal. He uses two different words in the Greek here for carnality, and I'm not going to struggle with them this morning. I'm sure you're not too interested. The point I want to emphasize is this. He says, you, you, you babes in Christ. You know, when a man is going to split a diamond, he, he has to be very steady. He look at it from different angles. He'll, he'll magnify any little crack. He could split the wrong way and just be no more valuable than uh, much glass. He's very, very careful. Or in England, we guard the Queen's jewels, the crown jewels. They're surrounded with, with an electric fence. You can't steal them. It's an impossibility. Nobody ever tried yet anyhow. I think of Michelangelo when he was cutting the head of David out of stone or his pieta. Careful lest, ooh, one slip. And that original piece would mean that the nose was tipped off or the ear. And it would be spoiled. But no man ever cut a diamond. Michelangelo never worked with more accuracy. No mother ever had a child that burned the heart like the care that the Apostle Paul gave to his church. The tragedy with so much evangelism is we, we record them as statistics and the preacher goes on next night. This Apostle Paul was no, 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 no uh, fly-by-night evangelist. The most precious thing we ever handle is the human soul. The Pieta one day will go up in dust. The Sistine Chapel will be blown to smithereens. But the soul of a man will live forever and ever and ever and ever. Either in eternal darkness or eternal bliss. Heaven is impeccable joy. There'll be no sorrow. Hell is eternal misery. There's no joy. There is only one way to heaven. There are a million ways to hell. What do you do to go to hell? Nothing. Just do nothing, that's all. You don't have to thumb your nose at God. You don't have to blaspheme the name of Jesus. You don't have to be adulterer. Just coast on. For the greatest sin in the world is not adultery. The greatest sin in the world is I can manage my life without God. That's the greatest thing. Paul has established the church, but now he's deeply, deeply concerned about them. He says they are babes in Christ. If you were here about a month ago, you heard <coughs> Leland Paris, who is the YWAM leader for the Americas, North and South America. He introduced his message by saying that he had been in a meeting about a week before with Bill Bright <coughs> and a few others. Bill Bright, the founder of the Campus Crusade, said this, that the Campus Crusade recently took a poll of Christians in America. And this is what he said. I, I've chewed this over. I've laid awake at night thinking of it. Bill Bright said that on their own confession, 95% of the people in America who profess to be Christian, and it would be true of other countries, 95% of the Christians in America said they were one of two things. Either I am carnal, a carnal Christian, or number two, I'm a babe in Christ. I think if we digested that, we might not have had any meetings from then till now. We might have been on our faces asking God Almighty. But listen, here's the thing. Uh, wh wh why is Paul arguing here with these people? He says, because I feed you with milk and not with meat. You've no digestible, you've no spiritual digestion. Well, listen. In America alone right now, we have... I dare to say this before God. I believe we have hundreds of millions of gospel cassettes. And we have millions of gospel books. And we have hundreds of Bible schools. And we have hundreds, over the year, we have hundreds of seminars. And we have people memorizing the scriptures. And we have about 5,000 radio stations who every day give some part of the scripture. And yet with all this stuff to feed on, dear God, where are we with all this stuff to feed on? 95% of us are spiritual cripples, spiritual infants, spiritual babes. Oh, it's not the only time he says that in Ephesians 4. 
Where is it? And verse 14, he, he, he's, he, he's careful about the Ephesians there, Ephesians 4.14, that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. He's fearful for the Ephesians. That's the end of part one, brothers and sisters. I hope it blesses you and strengthens you. You know, and I hope you reflect as I do. How are we living? Are you living as an Athenian? Is it all about knowledge? Is it all about seeking the, the newest book, the newest video, the newest this, the newest that, to enhance our mind, to gain more knowledge? Are you more Corinthian? Are you more fleshly? Is it, is it all about the things of the world, the prosperity, the, the Mercedes, the, the money? The, is it all about that? You know, we don't need more knowledge. We need knowledge of Jesus Christ. We don't need the things of the world. We don't need to chase after those things. We need to chase after Jesus Christ. I hope you're not a carnal Christian still living in the world. And I hope you're not a babe in Christ just constantly waiting for someone to bring you your next bottle of milk for that next video, that next whatever it may be to to give you a little nourishment. Now I hope you're seeking the Father, Son, and Spirit with your whole mind, heart, and soul. I hope you're seeking the Scriptures. I hope you're seeking Jesus Christ and following Him and not just waiting for the next wind of doctrine that comes your way to blow you this way or that. Now get to know the truth of Jesus Christ. Get to know the truth of His salvation. Shake off the bottle and the diapers and grow in Jesus Christ. Don't forget to pray for the children, your fellow brothers and sisters all around the world. And for those still lost in the darkness, so that they too can see the light. May our Father bless you. May He keep you. May His grace shine upon you. Give you peace. See you next time.